All right, at this time, we now have Doug Song, Duo Security Chief Executive Officer, and Jennifer Tejada, Pager Duty Chief Executive Officer. Please welcome them to the stage. Hi, guys. Should we go? Oh, am I at the desk or are you at the desk? You at the green chair? You sit chair? there. I'll sit there. You should get the green chair. All righty. Always wanted to be Jimmy Fallon. Oh, like that? Oh, okay. <laughs> you want to do this? This is That's uncomfortable. So weird. That's weird. Okay. Like oh, one? I got the green chair. Yes. Hi. Hello. How are you? We in the food coma zone right after lunch? <sighs> Maybe. You guys okay. awake? All right. Well, okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. Man, I thought, I thought Sasser was just a blog. <laughs> Amazing. I'm not going to tell Jason you said that. <laughs> well, I'm in Michigan. I don't get out a lot. There you go. Go blue. So uh, we, we learned before we got here that University of Michigan grads have taken over Saster. We were killing it. You just saw Jeff Lawson, also a Michigan grad. Doug and I both went to Michigan, not at the same time, but uh, you know, have connected over our, our background from the Midwest and school. But more recently, we compare a lot of notes. We, we were introduced by a mutual friend, and it started this relationship where we, we would just immediately get into all the challenges and, and problems we were solving for and some of the small victories. And we've learned a lot from each other over the last couple of years. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. So I thought we would kick off by talking about philosophy. Uh, I think both Doug and I have found some common ground on the intentionality with which we've designed organizations in terms of the way we think about people, leadership, scale from the board to the, the culture of the types of employees that we're recruiting, and how we make the experience of being part of Duo or part of Pager Duty a sort of career-making, life-changing experience. So why don't you share a little bit about your philosophy at Duo? All right, sure. Well, before we get into that, I just want to say, you know, I, I've known Jennifer since before uh, either of us were unicorns. And, and <laughs> frankly, I think we've always kind of had Oh, it's mixed emotions about yes. that, that designation and what it, you know, what it represents. But I, I do want to bring you a little bit of a gift from. Oh, you, uh, thank you. Oh, look, see now, now it's true. There you now go. it's real. No, thank you very much. Of course. It, I, I want to be in any club you're in. <laughs> so, so in terms of our philosophy, um, you know, we 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 decided to build a company from the start that would really go after a, the largest opportunity in our space, right? And um, truth be told, I, uh, I ran from security as an industry when I, um, you know, probably two companies ago, because it just gotten so crazy, so crowded, 1,200 vendors, um, a lot of customers who didn't know what was effective and they're buying stuff that they shouldn't. But we came back to it and we realized that with, you know, cloud and mobile, all this kind of stuff, there was a huge opportunity for us to rationalize all that. And so the, the, the thesis we always had as, as, as a company was how we come back and decimate <laughs> Basically, the market, right? Can, could, could we go and, and take a lot of these companies that were building kind of yeah. one feature products and kind of roll them up, r roll up that uh, value as part of a, a, a cloud delivered platform at scale and kind of become that sales force of security? Um, and so for us, it was always sort of a mindset that we, we wanted to go and take on the industry at large, right? Not, not specific, you know, competitors, not specific, um, you know, markets. But that colored everything, right? From, from the very beginning, we... Uh, you know, in order to do that, we, we knew that we would have to found the company on different kind of principles, and we really would take effectively a design kind of thesis, right, to how we'd uh, rearrange all that stuff. Um, and so I think from, you know, the, the guiding principles of, of kind of what we start from, uh, we're, we're, we're always there. And it, it kind of led from our, our strategy and product to the, the culture, right, and, and the operations really behind how we would operate, how we would disrupt, you know, product category after product category in, in, in the entire industry to think about the consumerization of security in ways that I think in, in IT had come you know, just ahead of us. And so that, that was kind of the, the idea behind all this. And, and for me, having you know, Duo will have been the fourth company that mm -hmm. was part of in security, um, the second I've started. But the, uh, the intention was for it to be our last, right? And, and, and really think about building for the long term. I think one thing that was maybe also a little bit different coming from Michigan was that, you know, most companies in Michigan, um, you know, the, the ones you've ever heard of, right, they tend to be very long-lived, generational. Um, as I like to say, in the Valley, we generate lots of tech companies, but mm -hmm. in Michigan, we've generated lots of industries, you know, automotive, furniture, kitty litter, um, pizza delivery, I mean... Football. Football, yeah. Yeah, we're getting back to that, finally. Finally. Um, but it's... Uh, 
you know, it's, it's a longer term sort of thinking. And I do think that uh, when it comes to scale and kind of thinking about how we set up um, for where we're headed, having a North Star like that is so important. Um, so I don't know, what was your philosophy? Like, what, what did you see in PageDuty when you came? You know, you could have done a lot of things. Yeah. But what was, there, what was interesting about that? Well, I was really fortunate. When I joined PagerDuty, Alex Solomon was the founder at the time. And, you know, he had made a decision to put the company ahead of his own personal ego and interests and, and bring in a leader who could scale the business. And, you know, oftentimes when a, a new leader comes into a business, they feel like they need to fix a lot of things. They feel like they need to change a lot of things to prove that it was the right thing to do. And I just found at PagerDuty so many things about the business were going in the right direction. Like there was such a very strong foundation, a um, deep interest in making the lives of our users better. And in many ways, PagerDuty is like a consumer company in that regard. You, you never heard people talk about our, our company customers. You heard people talk about our practitioners, our users. So. Our philosophy has always been to start with the user experience and solving problems for the user and, and trust that that is going to benefit the business and the company. And it means that you know, it changes the way you think about design. It changes the way you think about culture. It changes who you invite to your summits to speak, et cetera. You want people that are going to resonate with the folks that are doing the work and the work that's really important. And so it wasn't so much my philosophy. It was recognizing this strength that we needed to build on, that I wanted to make sure we didn't accidentally, you know, um, uh, hurt. Yeah, having a purposeful culture, I think, right? Totally. It's, it's so important because the, the things that you do when you're small, right, it, you know, I think I've heard said, you get amplified, right, as you, yeah. as, as you scale. Um, but they also provide the guardrails for it in so many ways. And I feel like, um, you know, as we thought about why we existed, why we brought the company together to, you know, prevent others, you know, prevent others from harm and all this kind of thing. Um, through all the gyrations and all the things we try, it was, it was, it was always going to be important to have, uh, again, a, a very explicit culture, right, of how we work with customers, of how we looked at the business from the outside in. And I think, you know, kind of, as you referenced, do the right things by customers leading to the right things for the organization. Totally. Um, I think uh, the former coach of the 49ers, uh, before we stole your last one, um, Watch. I think he had had a book called The uh, Score Will Take Care of Itself. Mm -hmm. And I've always believed that to be true, right? That if you did the right things for customers and so forth, that, you know, um, all, all good would come from that. And so, um, so those kind of things, I think, writ large, have continued to carry our business in ways that, um, again, customers can connect with deeply, that, you know, we, we partner authentically with them, um, but also written in a way where as we onboard and bring other folks into the company at scale, can, can follow those trails and, and adopt that as their mission, as their purpose, in ways that uh, uh, are actually operational, right? And I think, how many of you are founders? Any founders here? Ooh, see, that's so cool. Yeah. Where the cloud meets, apparently, Saster Annual. I, one of the things that I think is really interesting about that is, as you scale your business, you're gonna bring on investors. You're gonna bring on board members and advisors and influencers. And there's this very strong gravitational pull to try and please those people, to really understand their agendas and try and you know, do right on their behalf. And I think one of the things that has set Duo apart for a long time is that just laser focus on getting it right for the customer and, and trusting that then everything will fall in place. You know, we say this at work frequently, like get it right for the customer, get it right for employees, and everything else will come together the way it should. But you're going to feel that. You're going to feel that gravitational pull of investors comparing you to their, their other portfolio companies, of giving you help and advice in thinking about what you do next, and just keep, keep that customer at the center of everything you're building and everything you're designing for. Yeah, so, so, so many ways, a lot of the, the operational practices of how we preserve the alignment, right, of, of our organization toward those kind of goals, yeah. you know, I think are, are things that, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, date back to the second year of our company, when we first, first started writing our sort of culture decks and kind of understanding. Which like, was when? How long ago was the second year of your company? Uh, 2012? 2012, okay. 2000, yeah, so, you know, some time ago. Hard to think that back, back that <laughs> far, but, um, but, you know, for us, it was, it was a lot of that kind of stuff, like, what do we stand for? What are the pillars going to be of our, of our business as we grow? And just like Amazon has these pillars of its business of, uh, you know, wide selection, lowest prices, convenient delivery, you know, what is the basis on which, you know, you, you really choose to compete, right, in, in sometimes very crowded markets, um, but also some practices that would 
carry a lot of that forward. Like, I, how many founders here still are involved in the onboarding of their employees? Right. So, so that's something that I still do. Right. Over 700 employees. Right. We we, we do an on, uh, onboarding and orientation, and there's always a founder session, right, where we catalog kind of all the decisions we've made and talk about that that shared history we've, we've, and journey we've been through. And um, and again, it's just important, I think, to impart that kind of orientation and, and knowledge. Other things that we had done also to get board, our board and other uh, folks uh, in line with, um, with our journey was to write a board report. And so I, I, all of you probably who have boards probably write investor updates and so forth. But for us, every six weeks, and this is something I learned from Luke and he's over at Puppet, um, we would write a board report, three to five paragraphs for every department leader of all the plans, progress, and problems in their business. And they would complain to me all the time, like, oh, do we have to do this again? You know, it's, it's, it's been a month ago. And I said, well, if you can't write to me sort of an update, and, and not just for me, but for our team, because we shared the board report with the entire company um, in basically the span of an email, then you don't actually know what you're doing. You don't actually know what you've done or don't know what you need to do. And so um, we basically share that as a Google Doc with comments enabled for a board to, you know, have conversations with us and focus then our board meetings on the two or three topics of most strategic concern. But those kind of things, you know, practices um, over time mm -hmm. built an entire sort of body of knowledge and practice that, you know, when we onboarded new employees, when I'd interview new, new executives, I'd give them the last eight, right? Every six weeks, you know, kind of octave basis, I could just give them basically the last uh, year's worth of history of the company, all the major successes, failures, learnings, and see how they'd react or internalize or in, in, and have a, a really meaningful discussion about this. Um, but it was so useful in so many ways to capture a lot of that. But again, a, a lot of the things, I mean, I'm sure you have other practices that are similar, right, to sort of inculcate, you know, a team and... Definitely, I mean, having, I'm, I'm on the puppet board and have been for several years, so I've been a <laughs> consumer of that board report and the, the thoughtfulness that goes into that ahead of time means that your board members come into the room already with a perspective of where the business is at and you can dig in and have a meaningful conversation about special topics that really require strategic thought that are going to have a big long-term impact, etc., as opposed to spending all of your time on the operations tactics, the read through or the read out as a lot of people call it. So I think it's a great practice. I, I think every company has its own um, ceremonies and, and things that they do, and they do very well. Uh, we both share green as our brand color, and green tends to stand out amongst a lot of the blue and the red that's out there, and our, our Dutonians, as we call them, are very proud of their green, and I think uh, engendering this idea of being proud of where you're from and what you do actually <laughs> creates heavy responsibility on the leader, because you've got to make sure that you continue to um, uh, build a culture where the behaviors, not just the words on posters, not just the, the names of your cultural Absolutely, values, where yeah. the behaviors are going to, to demonstrate day after day uh, a place and a culture and an organization that your teams are proud of. Right, every company's gonna have those you know, demotivational posters like teamwork, you know, <laughs> all this kind of stuff, right? And, and it's all the same stuff. But it is about the lived practices, right, of how we put our values, right, into, into action. And I think um, you do have to create the space and the, the framework, right, for, for that to happen. So other ways, like we, we would do board reports for us as leaders that be able to tell the company at large what we thought was important. But just as much, we needed ways to surface what was important, right, across the, the org um, in the opposite direction. And so one of the ways we did that was maybe a little bit different, but uh, we took it from a Jewish deli called Zingerman's down the street from us in Ann Arbor. Those of you oh yeah, know. awesome. Yeah, it's a force of nature, but at um, any rate, Zingerman's has a, a, a cultural practice that we just stole, right, <laughs> called appreciation. So we open or close every large team meeting with three to five minutes of specific thanks, right, thanking each other for the things that we've seen each other do that have made the team successful. And we train on how to give feedback more generally, right? Hearts, diamonds, spades, clubs. Hearts are positive but unspecific feedback. Diamonds are positive specific feedback. Clubs are unspecific critical feedback and similarly spades are specific critical feedback. And spades you always give in private, but diamonds. Diamonds we want to be surfaced in public and all the time because that's how we actually model the behavior that we want to see. And in a company that's growing at hyper growth, where, as we say, we push decision making down with a similar kind of decision framework. Like I said, I don't care about the quality of any individual decision, but I care a lot about the quality of our decision process. 
um, you know, we, we, would, we would make sure that every decision was guided by the same thing. Is the right thing for the customer? Is the right thing for the company? Is the right thing for our community? But at the end of the day, we would never, there was no way to stay on top of all the, the right decisions that were made. Yeah. And all the things that we would need to elevate and standardize in order to scale. And so by, cusp, by our, our employees actually thanking each other in the very public setting, we would actually surface that in ways that we would be able to crowdsource and understand. And so, you know, half of the challenge of scale is just staying on top of what's actually happening in your own organization. And certainly things like Slack have helped. Um, even before Slack, every company... You had, how many Slack channels are you stalking on a given day? I have no idea. But we have more <laughs> Slack channels than people, right? And maybe my organizations are the same. Um, so it is hard to stay on top of everything. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, figuring out ways to surface kind of, uh, you know, the, all those nuggets of goodness, yeah. right? And again, level it up and, and make it repeatable is, is, is half the challenge of scale. You, you, there are a lot of challenges to scale. I think that's why this has become such a, a popular event uh, in and of itself. And one of the things I think our companies had in common from an operational standpoint or have in common is the high velocity you know, land motion, the flywheel effect mm -hmm. in the expansion motion. And one of the things that I found when I came to PagerDuty was in an industry where we're constantly looking for best practices that we can appreciate and copy and reapply, there, there weren't best practices that we could go just steal. If we tried to bring in kind of the Oracle Splunk elephant hunting motion, it didn't work for the way our, our users who tended to be developers wanted to engage with our product. And so we really had to build our own, our own model. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of experiments. We burned a lot of pancakes before we got it to sort of mm -hmm. golden brown. And we've got some of our go-to-market team here today. What were some of the biggest challenges you found in scaling that model, particularly given you're not sitting in the center of the valley. There's not 10 companies around you doing the exact same thing. Well, to be frank, I saw it sort of as a benefit because, you know, I, I joke about, you know, disaster being just a blog, but for us, that's what it was. I've never been to disaster. None of us have been. Is this your first time to disaster? This is my first time to disaster, yeah. Let's, let's give it up for Doug <laughs> speaking at his first time to disaster. Very happy to be here. But, uh, but I certainly read everything that yeah. Jason ever wrote. Like, that was kind of the Bible, right? We called him Brother Lemkin, right? It was the way we kind of referred to a lot of what we ever read there. And, all. and you know, we, but we, just as much we read, like, David Cummings, we read David Kellogg, we read, you know, Tom Tenguz, we read uh, Alex Clayton. Right? We read so many, just like venture capital, all this stuff has been demystified. It's yeah. no longer the realm of the black arts. And so that's where we sort of got a lot of our kind of grounding. Um, talking to a lot of other founders, right, was, was where we got the rest of it, frankly. Um, and particularly at this stage of the journey, when, when, when we were achieving, you know, big scale, preparing for maybe a potential entry to the public markets, all that kind of stuff. You know, guys like you just saw, right, Jeff Lawson. Oh, yeah. Amazing. So, so generous with his time, um, with me, not just because of our mission connection. Um, you know, uh, Samir Delakia from SendGrid, um, who I know you spent some time yeah, talking totally. to as well. And, um, Toby at Shopify, you know, Matt at Viva, like all, all these folks, Scott Dorsey out of Indianapolis and Exact Target, you know, one thing, you, you know, you shouldn't be shy about, and this is something that we've talked about totally. too, is, is about asking for help or, or like reaching out, right, to other founders to get some perspective. Um, and likewise, returning that call when someone reaches out to you. Yeah. Because you, you think about, I mean, I, I remember calling Greg Schott from MuleSoft once, I had a question, he called me straight back, that's turned into monthly coffees, we compare notes all the time, you know, Lucerne, same thing. You and I, Doug, Doug emailed me, says, I'm gonna be in San Francisco on Monday, Monday's Memorial Day. I'm like, okay, well, drop off the 13 year old at David's Tea and we sit down and, you know, we, we start talking about our businesses, but it is, so that no one can know or understand the pressure that a CEO is under, because it's not just about work, right? It's also your family, it's your board, it's your customers, it's your investors, et cetera. And so that bond that I think sort of naturally develops is a really important one and not one that everybody knows is out there and available. Yeah, it's a lonely job and uh, you know, mental health is health, right? It is very important to you know, keep you know, yourself in the uh, good spirits of other folks who've got your back. Speaking of health, what happened here? Uh, you, you can guess. <laughs> Skateboarding. Yeah, there you exactly, go. Exactly. Doing something really dumb, but uh, at least I got the picture. <laughs> Check my tour if you want. But um, so, so when I think he came to you know us thinking about scale and building out in, in Michigan, the other half of it was the fact the opportunity 
to actually do it differently. Like you say, like, yeah. all these things are inputs, but they're not directly you know, tactics and strategies you can, you can often apply. And so you have to be adaptable. And like for instance, tomorrow you'll see hopefully my, uh, my VP of inter inside sales, Jennifer Lawrence, who joined Duo from a enterprise SaaS company selling you know, just to healthcare, like big, massive healthcare, healthcare deals. And she had never done inside before. But she joined Duo, working in the tutelage of my um, head of all worldwide sales, yeah. uh, Jim Sib, who had just come out of the Zendesk IPO, and had had plenty right, to, to kind of shape for her, but also said, do it your way. And what's so important about that is that, you know, for companies like us, for any, any small startup, right, you, you're not better resourced, you're probably not smarter, and you shouldn't necessarily work any harder right, than any of your competitors. But the most important thing is to learn faster and outrun anybody in terms of finding new routes of success that your competitors won't. And so what we were optimizing for, because we're the same thing, high velocity, high volume, high margin, but what's most important is that uh, we need to do that not just in terms of our commercial you know, design, but in terms of our organizational operation yeah. and learning faster, right? And so that's why I say, like, we would push the stitch making down, you know, we, um, we needed to have sort of a commander's intent or what have you, borrowing from military analogy, which I hate doing, but, but we needed everyone to sort of have that North Star, know what we're running toward, um, but be able to go and try lots of things until we found ways, again, that we could, um, uh, again, do things better, or at least differently than our competitors would. And at the end of the day, all that kind of summed together made for a very different customer experience and journey, right, for our market than they'd ever seen before. And that's what actually has led to kind of the larger ongoing scale for us, that it, um, you know, it, it, the, the, you know, the feedback loops within our business that all tie together were born sort of out of, out of a lot of efforts from our teams cross pollinating each other, working together to find all those points of intersection, um, but again, with a grand design that we could all align to. Um, so anyway, I, I just encourage that, you know, for those of you who might be more sort of command and control or top down or whatever sort of leaders, that you let go a little bit. And you have to have ways in which, you know, it comes back and you sort of preside over it. I'm not sure if you feel well, exactly the same. I, like, 100%. I mean, it's yeah. funny you say that. So PagerDuty started its journey in the DevOps community. And one of the core tenets of DevOps is to empower individuals with information so that they can make the big decisions closest to the action, right? Which is the direct opposite of command and control. You know, if you've got a customer or company that's burning because of a technology issue or an issue um, with a customer experience in an app, right? One of the challenges that happens is if you've got to float that decision through a linear ticketing platform up to a senior leader and wait for it to come down, that, that customer is gone, so are a couple hundred thousand others. And so I had to change my leadership style. I had to learn to listen to the individuals in our organization who were closest to our user community. And even when, when something's going down at work and you have an incident you know, and, and something's not working, learn the incident commander during that incident is my boss. When I come into the war room during an incident, they call it the executive swoop and poop. So, <laughs> the seagull like, right flying. Yeah, exactly, right that one. Right, right. And so, you know, just learning, like I've learned a lot from our community mm -hmm. and our employees. And, so, you know, part of that is checking your ego at the door and being open, like being open to, to the fact that everybody around you probably knows more than you do about something. Yeah. And, and being open-minded to that. I, I'm usually the dumbest person in the room 100%. Right, in, in, in most of my meetings. And it's the same thing coming from the, you know, where I came from. Because before I did any companies, I was something of a software communist doing open source. <laughs> and in that community, right, it's all just volunteer. You can't tell anyone what to do. But even at this stage, right, this scale of our company, everyone has choices, right? There's so many great SaaS companies to go and join. So we have to offer something different. And so when we thought about you know, the, the, the platform we're building, not of the, the technology and the product, but of the company. Could we build a platform opportunity where understanding deeply every person's story arc of their career and life, you know, and how to align their opportunity, you know, mm -hmm. our needs as opportunities, what they wanted to do, we could all grow together, was the most important thing we were looking for in terms of our management style and, um, and leadership style. And so we spent a lot of time really looking for um, employees that were deeply self-aware, you know, with a lot of behavioral learning questions, like tell us the biggest misconception about you or have you. We look for leaders who had, had a history, right, of, of traveling, um, very, traveling distances with teams that grew with them, mm -hmm. right? Because 
you know, there are many ways to be successful. We just chose, in, in a very intentional way, how we, how we wanted to be. And I'd say it looked a little bit more like, um, you know, to, to choose two extremes in the SaaS kind of leadership model. You know, Matt Wallach from Viva had, you know, and the Viva team had sort of one, Peter as well. And then I'd say like Godfrey from Splunk had another, right? Mm -hmm. And like Splunk was, Godfrey was like, we want folks who've been there, done that. We don't got time for this, right? Viva was like, we're gonna grow all of our leaders mm -hmm. from the inside. And, you know, on balance, we're, we were a little bit more of, the, of, of Viva than we were Splunk. But by the same, same, same token, we, we knew that there were things that we would have to have to, to, to really be able to accelerate and, and, and have, introduce the right perspectives in our company. And so while we, we weren't in Silicon Valley, we needed a little bit of Silicon Valley in us. And so we did seek out very specifically, um, you know, in certain roles, uh, some of that leadership that came with that experience and perspective to share. Um, but again, you know, one of the benefits I think we had in Michigan um, versus maybe in the Valley is that there, there wasn't so much an echo chamber of everyone sort of seeing, reading, and kind of following the, exactly the same things. We had a much greater cognitive diversity of all the folks we were able to bring in, and uh, arguably a greater diversity overall. Um, that's something you've done, done extremely well. Well, we're trying. I mean, it's it's a journey, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, we sort of try and focus on the I in DNI, the in inclusion. Like, how do you make discovering pager duty becoming part of pager duty? You know, having impact at pager duty, but also pager duty having a positive impact on you all feel equitable and everybody having the same opportunity to kill it as opposed to certain groups having privilege over others. And it's meant that you have to operationalize a lot of behaviors. It starts with leadership. So, you know, our leadership team is gender balanced. That was not easy to do. 65% mm -hmm. um, of our leadership team is born outside the U.S. Also not easy to do because there's lots of brilliant people just hanging around SOMA. They, you know, it would be easier, quicker to just bring it south of market in San Francisco, for those of you from out of town, it'd be easier to just bring those people in. And, and, and frankly, like the whole, the whole system sort of works against you because the recruiters, your investors come to you with athletes and those athletes tend to be white males. And, 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 I, merc and mercenary. And right? mercenary. Which is, which is something that, you know, again, there are many ways to be successful. I just never could do that. I would never work with a team where, of, of, of folks who were con continuously rotating that were kind of out mostly for themselves versus kind of the team totally. and so forth. And I, and so th there's, for those of you who aren't in the Valley, you know, I encourage you, I'm mean, great that you're here, but I encourage you not to be discouraged about uh, anything that you might be lacking from, you know, being in this, in this, in this region. Um, there's something strategic, right, about every place you could set up. And the, the real work in actually building a scalable organization is to figure out what that is. What is strategic that you can apply? In our case, you know, one of those things was the fact that Michigan and you know Ann Arbor is. You're like the king of Ann Arbor now. Though, well, too, Ann Arbor's right? a pretty small place, yeah. right? We can fit yeah, everyone in Ann Arbor in king. the stadium, right? So it's pretty small. But you know, one of the nice things about you know the, what the culture of Ann Arbor is is, is learning, yeah. right? Like that's learning and the team, the team, the team, right? You know, so and those, you know, as we talked about before, are the elements of what drove our success and how we chose. Right, to go about um, building something will be highly disruptive. Um, you'll figure out, again, what those things are for you, but I, I encourage you to draw upon what that looks like and, and institutionalize it. Because, you know, again, like, again, the small things you do when you're, when you're small, if you, do the, if you do them well and they really are strategic values to you, they, they will help you scale. Um, so in terms of those learned behaviors, right, you know, we, 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 we did a lot of that stuff at a micro level where uh, we would talk about assuming positive intent, Mm -hmm. Right. We, we, one of our core values at, at Duo has been to be kinder than necessary, which is not a not a statement about being just nice. Right. It's uh, not like uh, say nice thing about Detroit or whatever. It's um, it's going out of your way to help each other be successful. And so those kind of behaviors have led to so many of the deep innovations we've had mm -hmm. in the business um, at every level. Right. Including how we do or it's the most effective team selling I've ever seen, right? Um, our legal team gets kudos all the time, right? From how they're, you know, Jumping a person, in. right? And in, in, in how they kind of move deals alongside um, and everyone can celebrate um, and, and own that together. What are things that you did that might have been, you know, like behavioral, right? Like a defined sort of a... Yeah, I mean, one of the things I did when I first came to PagerDuty, I, um, I'm a little bit of an extrovert and I like to have fun, and, it, and I actually have been intentional, and intentional about making sure the work 
stays fun for me, that work is fun for our teams. We like to, we have a party or a celebration. There's a cupcake almost every day for something at PagerDuty, making sure that we never lose sight of if you're going to spend 80% of your waking time somewhere, you know, why are you doing that? Like when you get out in the morning, out of bed in the morning, what are you excited about? So, so we're trying to build fun and laughter and joy. Yeah into everything that we do and seeing some of the big ugly challenges as the big ugly problems as as fun challenges that yeah. you want to tackle so not taking ourselves too seriously because we're founded by canadians we're already nicer than necessary we're almost canadian um, in michigan yeah and i'm from minnesota so it's like, it's like nobody's mean at page of duty it just it's not, it doesn't happen uh, so I think that was a big part of it was like bringing joy into the into the work that we do with our customers, with our users, etc. And then also um, being really explicit about what winning looks like. Yeah. So we've got company kickoff next week and yeah. we'll stand up there and we'll not just talk about what the long term goal and what the numbers are. We're going to envision like at the end of this year, what will it feel like to be pager duty in the end of three years? What will that feel like? What will it feel like for our users? And how do we continue to dis disrupt ourselves? Yeah, Le le right? leading your teams through change is the hardest part of this job anyway. Oh yeah, I think, particularly you know? in hyper growth, right? Yeah. How many times have you had to sort of change and tweak your leadership team as a part of oh, this yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, there's sort been of growth curve? Yeah, you know, leadership errors of, of, of any company, right? And we've talked about every year, we're, we're basically a different company. Now we're not all different leadership, right? You know, Typically we kind of have at least two years sort of span in which we kind of have a fully uh, committed and, and uh, locked uh, leadership team, but you do have to think about that stuff and, and paint the forward picture for teams in ways that they can understand yeah. and, and, and internalize the change that's to come. Because it, and again, maybe other folks do this differently, but for me, um, I, I don't know how to tell people uh, to kind of take something if we haven't socialized yeah. a lot of and, and brought them in. Because I think for decisions, decisions to stick. They have to have two things, right? Clarity, but also buy-in. And, and folks have to have an understanding of how they can own a lot of those decisions, create their own commitments, and help align their efforts to them um, you know, as much as leadership. And so, um, you know, so I, I feel like uh, the, the best teams that I see really achieve that scale have a way that that, that basic kernel of, 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 of how that works within a team really cascades and cascades really well. And so um, and you guys wear it on your sleeve. Like one thing I see, um, you know, uh, companies like yourselves or our, or our team have to do well is employer branding, is it is in creating a real, truly an, an employee value proposition, Yeah. which again, my, uh, my, my former head of people in Roger Vertezzi did an amazing job of. She, she has a whole HR open, uh, open source kind of movement she's kind of built yeah. with all these CHROs talking about this stuff. But more, but more and more, um, you know, that, that, that same uh, challenge of, of how do I manage sort of a, a inbound funnel, right, of, of, of sales and marketing applies actually to talent. And you want to have talent self-select its way to you. You want to manage basically, again, that flow um, and of ways in which you have those kind of feedback loops sort of what's kind of worked well and what hasn't. Um, you know, we used to ask these very interesting questions um, of, of all of our hires, you know, like what makes you unique? Um, because what we were really looking for was a cultural contribution they would bring to our company, not a cultural fit. You know, yeah. they, they need to share our values, but more than that, they need to bring something new, hopefully, that we didn't have already. Because if they didn't have that, you know, uh, you know what, 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 what was going to, what, what's going to drive the scale, yeah. right? We need those alternate sort of mental models, frameworks, um, skill sets, and experiences. And so, we, you know, we built hiring practices. Um, we had, uh, you know, a lot of, um, you know, I remember Matt Kohler from, ben yeah. from Benchmark talking about how, you know, in hiring, maybe you take a product or product marketer um, and have them take the challenge of actually operationalizing that whole program. Because, you know, product marketers think this way. You know, how do I talk about the key value proposition? How do I kind of and all this stuff, and so we worked really hard to operationalize those things in ways that made it completely repeatable, made it you know, inbound, because that, that, that's gonna be hard, you know, some of the hardest parts of, of, of scale, like finding the right people. There's a lot of hard stuff in scale. We got like two and a half minutes left. You wanna do a little speed round? Right, let's do Okay, it. what's the most important decision you made in the zero to 50 million in ARR run? Uh, decision of the first level of uh, our, our leadership change, where at about 10 million, 
I brought on board effectively the nucleus of Zendesk's uh, go-to-market engine. I brought okay. on board Jim Sib, um, Jeff Wiss, and uh, Zach Erlocker, and we, we basically went from 1 to 3 to 10, from 10 to 30 to 73, and then I, I'm not supposed to be talking about the rest of those numbers and hundreds, but, <laughs> but at any rate, that's... Um, okay, so 100 plus. 100 plus is interesting. Um, I, I think it was about finding the, the different overlapping S-curves of growth. Because in the early, you know, product market fit, right, in Series A, product market fit. Series B, it's about making things repeatable, and sometimes with a foolish consistency. But in Series C, where you're, you're looking at kind of the larger strategic risk, right, you're, you're big enough that people care about you, and you've got to worry about that, but you need to figure out how you sustain the growth when your initial, you know, strategies might have reached the point of diminished returns. You have to manage a portfolio of growth. And so we've always thought about different parts of our business in startup, growth, and scale mode. And of course, the latter, you know, you're finding different people, you know, for, for, because they, they, they will, you know, you have builders, you have growers, and then you have operators. And for different parts of our business, right, we would be, and we still are, right, in, in all those stages across different segments of our business at a given time, and being thoughtful about how we would size our investment, look at kind of uh, managing, right, the, the, basically the life cycle of learning Right, what's the next increment of learning or success? As you say, we would win or we'd learn, right? And so, so on that note, we have 47 seconds left. Yes. What are you most proud of? You've built an incredible business. You've delivered an incredible return back to many investors, employees, and friends of Duo. What, what are you most proud of? Knowing that this is not the end of the journey, this is just you know, yeah. the start of another one. Yeah. The, 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 the legacy of creating a different model for what a successful business can be in our, in our industry and one that is really people-centered, both from a product perspective and customers, but also from employees. And, um, and also leaving a legacy of, again, a bunch of our, our, our folks all having had the best experience in their careers right, uh, with us and beyond. And so that's, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with uh, kind of duo over the long haul. Um, and we're certainly very excited to contribute to all of Cisco's transformation. But I think um, yeah, as we look back, you know, that's, that's what we're most proud of. Awesome. Well, thank you for hanging out with me today. Thank you, John. Here for Doug. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>